Hello, so we're Pont Freed. Can I take your order, please? Hello everybody and welcome to the Gibbons Talks Boxing YouTube channel. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. Uh, I'm very pleased to be joined by Bradley Price. How are you today, Bradley? Thank you, I'm good, yeah. And uh, you just informed me, even though I did see it on Facebook, I think, or on social media, that's your birthday today, so happy birthday. Big 40, so I made it. <laughs> <laughs> What's your plans for today? Any uh, celebrations lined up or anything, or do, do anything over the weekend? I pretty much um, celebrate with the family, and um, yeah, so it won't be too much happening today, because i got to be leaving for work early in the morning, so. Okay. So, so a changed man from the Bradley Price of old then. That's so. Very <laughs> okay, then, mate. Um, so anyway, uh, Bradley, how, how did you first become involved in boxing? Where, where did the your your uh, your involvement in the sport start? Yeah, I I was um, I think I was about nine, and my dad was taking my two brothers to Newbridge Boxing Gym at the time. And I was going karate. I like, <laughs> karate was something I wanted to do. I like kick, I like to run around. I, like, I was just a, a young kid. Um, but then my dad would pick us up on the weekends. And it all, it'd be a case of, I was the boxing going, boys. I mean, and I was the third one there. And it was never a case of, I was karate going. So um, I guess that's, that's how I got into it for, just for a bit of attention, I guess. I thought yeah. it left out from karate, so I got knocked on the head and I joined the boxing. And I actually remember, I remember going to some boxing shows with John Radmore, the late John Radmore. I don't know if you remember John, he was involved in the, the, British, uh, the Welsh setup for a while. Um, but I remember seeing you and your brothers and your dad at some of the, some of the amateur boxing shows around Wales when you, when you were kids. Yeah, well, we, we was um, all, all good. Um, I was always thought as as the worst of the three, to be fair. But uh, yeah, I was always thought of as the least best of the three brothers. And yeah, and obviously I I got the turn out own late in life. And you all had, from what I can remember, I mean, I'm going back quite a long time now, but you all had similar styles. You were all very flashy and you all had really good boxing skills and you tended to stand out for most of the other young boxers on the shows? Well, my oldest brother, Byron, he was more of a boxer. Me too, I was trying to be a bit of a sugary Leonard, drop my hands and all that rubbish. Um, but I was a bit of a boxer, but Delroy, the middle brother, he was the banger. You know I mean, he was, he was knocking people out, even as an amateur. So that's why everyone thought he was going to probably be the best of the three. But uh, yeah, he, he was knocking people out all, I mean, quite often in the as as an amateur. Um, so yeah, so it was me and Byron was more boxers, tall, uh, tall, gangly, and Dowie was more the Mike, little, little mini Mike Tyson. <laughs> and of course, you were trained by uh, the late Enzo Calzaghi in the Newbridge gym. What was your memories of those times with with Enzo? Yeah, it was brilliant. Um, I mean, it was a family. I mean, and I felt when the when it come to an end, training with Enzo and everyone kind of drifted off from the gym. I mean, the family was. I mean, the family was over. But I mean, growing up, that was a family, and it was. A, I mean, it was a massive part of my life, and it was a shame that it come to an end. But um, yeah, it was just. Brilliant. I mean, he davis up his house training every weekend in the morning, sprinting hills. Yeah, it was just a brilliant experience. And have you any stories from Enzo during his amateur times when he was training you back in those days? Um, well, it's probably a, probably quite a lot of stories to tell. Because <laughs> he was a real character uh, from, uh, from the Welsh boxing scene. <laughs> Yeah, we quite partial to the slap on the face and stuff like that. I mean, if, if in the corners and stuff, and yeah, you would listen then. You know, I mean, we'd um, 
normally we we sometimes we normally we'd be scared like no I mean we wouldn't get one all off by Enzo and our mother would sometimes say if we was naughty she'd tell Enzo <laughs> in one hour happening. But um, yeah, it, it was just it was just like a big family. And what did you achieve in amateur boxing? Did, did you win any Welsh titles? Yeah, I, I um, think I won every Welsh championship I entered. I think maybe seven. Seven in total, I think. And I won the uh, school ABAs, which, uh, which was a good achievement. And it was um, me, me and my two brothers, three of us, all boxed on the same day for the British title. Uh, the British title so um it was a big story on that at the time um three of us had a chance to win it but um we we think I'm the oldest brother got robbed so okay first won it but <laughs> didn't get and in the gym at the time as well I'm right in saying that you of course had uh, Joe Kalzagi you had uh, Gavin Reese as well yeah it was yeah it was a good gym from from the from just starting at the boxing gym at the age of 10, we had Joe there, we had Byron Award, Darren Award, and yeah, it was, it was just, we had everyone there, and it was, it was good, obviously, late in, late in life, we had, um, we was joined by Gary Lockett, and Tony Dockerty, and Enzo McAnally, so the, the gym just grew then, but yeah, in the younger days, in the old days, when I was just in my early teens, I mean, it was pretty much me, Gavin, Joe, and my two brothers. So what made Enzo Calzaghi such a, a good trainer to produce you know, boxers of that quality from such a small place like Newbridge? Just think is uh, the way he got us to train. I mean, he didn't take no crap from us. I mean, he made us get the work done. He made, he made us train, train really hard. And... Um, yeah, I just think he just seemed to get the best out of each each and every one of us, and that was just his his way of doing things, and kind of paid off for all of us. Was it always your intention to turn pro? Was there always the dream as a, as a young boy, or was it just something you, you moved into? Well, as an amateur, I mean, I, <laughs> I didn't think I could be beat. To be honest, I I had a good style. I, I was stylish, and I think. Um, Possibility, possibility of going to the Olympics was all, was something I would have wanted to do, but at the time the the, the I think it was two federations at the time. There was a lot yeah. of rubbish. Going, there was a lot of stuff going on, and we wasn't getting the opportunities. So it it just made sense to turn pro. And obviously, my two brothers were already pro, and the gym everyone. Boom. I thought, why not? Let's go. Let's go for it. Because at the time, the, the Welsh Amateur Boxing Association split in two, in effect. Uh, the, I think it was the yeah, Welsh yeah. Boxing Federation and the Welsh Amateur Boxing Association. And at certain gyms, I think your gym or Newbridge ABC was with the federation, am I right in saying? Yeah, we was, yeah. So it was, it was just a load of, load of stuff going on behind the scenes and stuff. And it just made sense to turn forward, to be honest. And I think I'm right in saying as well that at the time... Amateur boxing wasn't as well funded as it is now in Wales or in GB. There was no GB setup as such as it is yeah. now. Well, no, me it wasn't um, wasn't anything at the time. It, it just didn't make sense to stay amateur. Just it, it just made sense to go make some money and turn professional. So that's what I've done. I. So, so what, what, what was the process you went through to, to turn pro? Did you discuss it with Enzo? Did you discuss it with, with your dad or, or anyone else within boxing? Well, we're going back 22 years now, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit cloudy in my head at the minute. but <laughs> I, I, Obviously, Enzo, I, Enzo um, spoke to me about it and the option was there to turn pro and I don't think I see any, any other option, to be honest. I thought, yeah, I'm just going to turn pro. And obviously he had a set up with Frank Bovin at the time. Uh, obviously because Joe was with Frank and my two brothers. Um, two, two brothers with pro as well. So it just made sense for me to sign the contract with um, Frank Bovin. And I just come off winning the Welsh title. 
and yeah, all go all go in for professional. So you had your pro debut. I'm looking here on the screen, um, 1999 against David Hines in uh, Doncaster Dome. Yep, Doncaster Dome. Um, I think that was at maybe super featherweight. Yeah, I think it was super. Uh, my first fight was like nine stone four, or something, something around there. And um, yeah, it was a points win. It was a you no know I mean, which is an easy run out for me, I guess. And yeah, I got a got a win. So it was happy days on to the next. And when when you started in the pro game, was the ambition to be a world champion? Were we were aiming right for the very top, or did you have we were aiming for the British title, or we were just what was the thoughts? I'm not not too sure, but. Um, I was with Joe and stuff then everything that was going on in the gym at the time I guess we all thought we were going to be world champions you know what I mean I thought oh but um, I guess my my issue was I was never dedicated to the sport I was yeah I was never dedicated to the sport and yeah that that's so for me to achieve Commonwealth title I got to be happy with that and I am happy with that but um, yeah, if, if I could go back, I'd dedicate myself a bit better and do things a bit different. But it is what it is. I, I got the way I did and that's it. I got to be happy with it. And I think in your, I'm looking here, your fourth fight or your fifth fight, you fought Peter Buckley, who's within boxing circles. He's a bit of a, a legend in the fact he's had, I don't know, a ridiculous number of fights, 200 odd fights. Uh, what, was he fighting? what was it like fighting Peter Buckley? Well, when I fought it first time, it was a four rounder. I felt um, when I boxed him, I, I felt afterwards I could have stopped them. I I thought I could have stopped them, but um, so further down the line, I got the boxing for the second time, and I knew what I was going to do because I thought first time I I should have I I could have beat him easier. So the second time. I went out and I stopped in the first round, but I re he's recently done an interview on that fight saying that he was in the worst shape ever and he shouldn't have took the fight. So it makes my first round win not, not look so good these days. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's human nature to make perhaps a little excuses when, uh, when things don't go your way. So maybe Peter's using a bit of poetic license there, but... Just to get a stoppage of Peter Buckley is a great achievement, really. Yeah, well, like you said, I boxed him first time, and I thought, I thought I could, I could stop, I could stop him if I fought him again. I um, and I boxed him again. Like I said, I went out and I think I beat him in like th maybe thirty seconds to a minute. And yeah, so it is what it is. I'll take it. <laughs> When you were when you started your pro career, did you notice that the, the guys you were fighting, the journeymen you were fighting, that they had a different attitude to boxing compared to the guys you were fighting in the amateurs? Whereas the guys in the amateurs, they were all looking to win. Whereas early in your career, you were fighting journeymen who were perhaps looking to survive rather than to try and win. I think maybe in my first ten fights, I I, I fought a few journeymen, but I was. I had few difficult fights in, in them 10 fights. I, like in my third fight, I fought um, Eddie Nevins, who was, I think he was 5 0 at the time and like four knockouts. And I think that was Gavin Reese's fight. Gavin Reese was supposed to fight Eddie Nevins, but I think Gavin might have had injury. So they, they, they chucked me in instead. So I took the fight. And yeah, it was a tough fight. I think that's, that might be the first time I've been. Got caught with a big shot against Eddie Nevins, but I I I I took it well and finished him off. But um, yeah, it was a good fight. But yeah, like I don't know how many gentlemen I fought in that time. Maybe four, five. I don't think I had many in my first ten fights. I had a couple of toughies. So what was the plan with Frank Warren to to move you along quite quickly then, because of your, your amateur class? Yeah, I was. Checking in there quite fast thing. I um I thought Jason Alden and I for the um for the Intercontinental in like I think that might could have been my eleventh, maybe twelfth fight. 
against um, Jason Orr. That was a tough one in Cardiff. Yeah. Just looking new now, yeah. So I, I've gone from like, a four, I think I went from like a four rounder to maybe a 12 rounder or something like that, maybe five, six. Yeah, Jason Hall on the, um, was that a- April 2001 in the uh, Cardiff International Arena? Yeah, so that, that was a quick step up to 12 rounds. And I mean, at the time I thought, oh, it, it'll be easy, but I was blown up my ass after like, Six rounds. It was a it was a tough old fight, and that, Jason Aldi was a good fighter. Um, I know my brother went and sparred him a few times, and he said he was tough, and yeah, he proved to be tough on the day. You've already touched on it a little bit around this time. How dedicated were you to boxing? Because I I know you uh, back in the day you, you had a bit of a reputation as someone who liked to party. I like to go out and, and live the high life. And you've already mentioned earlier in the interview that um, perhaps you were as dedicated as you should have been. So around this time of your career, I mean, how dedicated were you? I don't think I was ever dedicated. If thinking back on it, I mean, um, yeah, I I never really dedicated myself to it. To be honest, I get coach. If I wasn't in training, I I'd be in the pub, and that's how it was. It was. I mean, if if I wasn't training, it was, that was time off. In, in the in the pub and yeah so I I can't really pinpoint when I when when I was properly dedicated to this you know what I mean obviously ends with having in camp maybe six weeks or eight weeks so that would be it but whenever I wasn't in training I mean I, I would be getting hammered somewhere <laughs> So even when you were in camp, were you were you cutting corners, or once you were actually in camp, were you dedicated? Um, I was dedicated. I think um, the Ted Bammy, my first, my first defeat. I think I definitely cut corners on that one. I didn't train properly. Um, yeah, and I was t- well. I was pretty much told you're fighting this boy. He's he's not very good. He's not very good. You'll beat me. He's just going there. He's just having an easy six rounder. Going there is gonna be easy. Just box his head off. Blah blah blah. So it was only like the day on the way in the day before. So people was coming up. He's saying, "You're fighting Bami." He was like, "Whoa, you want to be careful?" And I, like, what? No, I mean, it, it was like, <laughs> and like, and I was like, "Oh my, I've not been the training. I'm not." And people, everyone's going on about this boy's power and stuff like that. I mean, I was just, oh shit, what have I done? And that was it. I come unstuck. He, he caught me one of them booming shots, and yeah, that was it. How difficult is it for a, a pro boxer like yourself, like like you were back in the day, that when you you mentally go into a fight and you're expecting it to be easy, and then you find out that it's a lot more difficult than you were expecting? Um, well, like the Bammy one, when everyone was saying out who he was, he's like, well, I can't believe you're fighting him at this stage of your career and stuff like that. And I was like, what? What's going on here? And yeah, it's just, it was just, um, just not a good position to be in. Like I said, no, I mean, everyone should be, everyone should be switched on before fighting stuff and everyone. And yeah, I just didn't do it properly. And then, uh- a couple of fights later, you were fighting Neil Sinclair for the uh, the British title, the welterweight title. What's your thoughts on that? What's your recollections? Um, yeah, it was a uh, obviously twelve rounds for the British. My first attempt at the British t- title, and yeah, I felt I was doing good, but I mean, that my arms, my arms, arms was always down low. I, I, I mean, I. Got caught with another booming shot. My legs went for a little dance in the ring. And yeah, it was a tough fight, but same again. I fought I fought him again in a um, few years down the line in the prize fight. And I mean, I, I, I knew I'd beat him. And I knew if I switched on, I know I know I could beat him. But like the first time, like, no, I mean, I, I thought I was could beat anyone. I thought I was brilliant. I thought this and that. And just come unstuck. And over your next 
half a dozen or so fights, you had a, a few losses. Um, did, did you question whether you were going to continue in the sport at this stage? I think because it was because it was my job. I, it, it's never been a question to not do it anymore because there's, there's nothing else to do. Is is all I've done since I was like nine. So it's never been a question of stopping, and that's obviously why my career. Is, I picked up so many losses throughout my career because, um, yeah, it's, it's just never been. If I could still tin in the box now. I still would. If, if <laughs> no, I mean, I'd be waiting for that phone call. If I had to fight yet, yeah, I'm on my way. I mean, I, I just like being in there. I like the little tussle, and results didn't mean nothing to me. I mean, from about 2012, 2012, I'd say results didn't mean anything to me. It was just a case of having a fight, and that's it. But during the, the mid-2000s, when you had a, a series of bad results, at, at this stage, were you still ambitious in, in, in boxing? Did you still want to win titles? Did you still think you could be a champion? Or, or did boxing start to just become a job at this point? I guess it was like a job, but it's because I've never been a fan of boxing. I mean, I've never been a fan. So it was like, I guess I never had any ambition in the sport. No, um, I never had a will to want win titles. I ne- never wanted to dedicate myself to go further. It was just a case of getting in and having a fight. You know I mean, if I, if I was fit, that was always a bonus. <laughs> I think some people might find it surprising because you, you shared a gym with, of course, Joe Calzaghe, the, you know, one of the best, if not the best, British fighter ever. A, a reputation for his amazing fitness, and then yeah. you, you, on the other hand, are saying about how you you were, weren't very dedicated. You sort of trained sort of when you felt like. Well, I think with it with training the Enzo, I think I dedicate. I did dedicate myself. You know I mean, it was like a family. You know what I mean, and um, you'd put the work in, and the the gym was everything. I think is when we left the. When I when we finished training with Enzo, and I moved on elsewhere, I think that's when the dedication pretty much died. Mm. In uh, March two thousand six, you fought for the Commonwealth title, and then won it. Um, what can you remember about that fight, badly in the Newport Centre? Um, I had a fight. Uh, who was I fighting? Fought Michael Jennings the fight before. For the British title, but then I was fighting David Barnes for the British. I was supposed to be fighting David Barnes in Manchester, um, so that was at welterweight. No, that could have even been light welterweight. I think it was, <laughs> I think it was like I was. I was scheduled to fight David Barnes at light welterweight in Manchester, and all of a sudden, I go to the gym and just says. You're not fighting Barnes now. I said, well, I said, you're fighting, <laughs> fighting in Newport now, top of the bill, Commonwealth title. I was like, whoa. So, yeah, so it was, a, and he said, is it light middle? So, where I was going to light, like, where I was going to light well to fight Barnes, it changed to <laughs> light middle to fight Ozzy Duran. So, there you go, that's the dedication I had. It was like, you no, know I mean, I couldn't stick at the weight. I didn't, I was floating, I was floating a, between weights and I, yeah, I went for light middle and I got the win. And I guess that's why I continued to stay at light middle. And I don't think I ever knew my proper weight because it's always up and down. It, yeah, so I dedicated myself to stay at the proper weight until obviously I won the Commonwealth and I stayed at light middle end for, the, for that period and then back to yo-yo and then between weights. And I mean, these days it probably doesn't get the the respect the title deserves. But the Commonwealth title, the, the old Empire title, is you no know, one of the old fashioned belts. It is a genuine title, and it is a great achievement for any professional boxer to win. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm happy. I I, I got it. Um, obviously, Gavin Gwynn has just won it after two failed British title attempts, which was the same as me. 
two failed British title attempts, and then I won the Commonwealth. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a great belt. And Ozzy Duran, I think he, he boxed nine Brits before me, and I think he won them all. So, I mean, he's a, he's a tough, he was a tough old fighter, and it was, it was a good win. And then, then you went through, uh, you made a number of defences of the Commonwealth title. Was it four, was it four defences, five defences? Six. Six uh, defences. I think it was six successful defences. And then obviously I, I fought Math Wall and that was, that was a, I think, yeah, that was the seventh defence. And yeah, I lost it on the seventh. And you fought in the Millennium Stadium a couple of times as well. What, what was that experience like? Um, well, <laughs> it was a good experience, but. Uh, when I was on, I I, don't, I think it was empty, to be oh, honest. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, does that does that affect? I mean, I know I know you're a professional fighter, and people say you've got to act professional, and all all the cliches come out when you watch Sky Sports and the different TV channels. But when there's no crowd there, or it's a big show like Kalzagi Bill, I presume it probably was, or one of the big heavyweight shows they had in Cardiff. Um, does it affect you? Does it affect you mentally when there's no crowd there? You have got this big, huge stadium, and there may be only no, a few thousand there. Um, no, I to be honest, if it was a if it was a choice to go on first when there's no one there, or it's a choice to go last when it's probably everyone's leaving, then I guess I prefer to go on first. I let no, me I I. I I suffered from nerves really bad when I was boxing. I mean, I, I was, no, I was, I was always scared getting in the ring. I, I, I mean, I hated it. Like, but um, so I preferred to get in first, get out of the way, and be done with it. That, that statement alone, the fact that you said you suffered from nerves and um, you know you were really anxious for fights, might surprise people who, who've met you because you come across, across as really confident. Yeah, and, and quite like you know, cocksure yourself, you know, there's a little bit of swagger, and and for, to say you were you know really apprehensive boy fights might surprise people. Yeah, I, I hated that. I, I mean, even now watching, if I watch my fights back, I, I don't believe it's me. I mean, it's like it, it's like an out of body experience because I mean, I don't think that's me in there. But um, yeah, I used to, I used to. I guess you could lose a fight. You know, they say you could lose a fight before you get in the ring, and I lost a lot of fights before I even got in the ring. I mean, I, I just, yeah, the nerves would get to me, and yeah, well, that that was me. I was, yeah, I, I hate that. I hate the feeling of it. I hate the feeling of getting in there fighting. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a fighter. I, I've never known to have street fights and stuff like that. I, I and a lot of boxers. You know I mean, they like Gavin Reese. I mean, with, that's where we're different. He, could, uh, he wouldn't care about anyone. He, he'd fight anyone at a drop of rat in the street. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't care. And with me, I hate that. I just, yeah, we're, we're different like that. And did you have uh, different techniques or what different things do you try to do to calm your nerves, if anything, for your fights? It'd just be a case of the bell going and... Getting punched in the face. <laughs> that, that, and that's why early in my career, I, I never came on, uh, started getting involved in the fight until like five, six rounds. And I was always known to come on stronger at the end of the fight and stuff like that. And that's just because, you know, I mean, at the start of the fight, I ate punching people, I ate getting punched. And I guess that, you know, I mean, that's why I always started slow and stuff. But when I, when I got start getting punched and stuff, that's where, that's where I feel like all my out of body experiences where, you know, when something just goes. And you mentioned getting punched. Um, of course, I mean, there's been quite a lot of stories about you sparring with the various guys in the, the Newbridge gym, especially Joe Calzaghi. I mean, were you the same in sparring? Apprehensive of getting hit or that type of thing? Or didn't it affect you so much in training? Um, well, when we sparred, we, it's the same sort of thing. Like, I, I hate this. Uh, I hate getting people in sparring, you know I, mean? I, I just, I think sparring is just tap and work on your technique and that. So when you've got a little Gavin punching me in the face, I'm thinking, whoa, that's cool. But, uh, yeah, I, 
I know they say you should have your fan shows be tough and stuff, which I had to do anyway because I didn't have an option in it. But for me, I, I I would just think keep a touch touch like. But yeah, it's just yeah, it's weird. Like I said, I ne- never boxing not something I wanted to get involved in. I think so. I guess that's where I get from. And what was it like sparring Joe Calzaghe? <laughs> it was well, it was an experience, wasn't it? But <laughs> it's, it's so fast and stuff. And if I could, if I could land a jab on him, I, I know mean, it is a little bit of um, you'd be happy with that. I mean, if I could jab his head back, and you would just <laughs> you know, bring a little smile to my head, look. But uh, yeah, he's just brilliant. He, it was just awesome sparring with him. I mean, I was I was going to go out to America with him to be a sparring partner. So, yeah, it was great. We all helped each other out, you know what I mean? And I'm glad that he only used speed on sparring with me. Not not so much power he used me as a speed speed boy. <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad on his power a little. And regarding Joe Calzaghe in the gym... Did you realise you were training with a boxer that was very special or, or was he just another one of the boys? Um, well, he's just one of the boys, isn't he? But, um, yeah, we knew he was special anyway. And, yeah, the, the old gym was brilliant at the time. The, you know I mean, with Enzo running things, it was, everything was just spot on. Everything was going good. And, yeah, he went on to achieve what he achieved. And I think we all knew he was going to do that anyway. And another thing that um, you, you were part of during your time with Enzo Calzaghe was the, I can't remember what it's called now, the ITV documentary. Uh, yeah, I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> which, which you featured in, you, you were one of the feature boxers they followed around for a, a while. What, what was that like? Yeah, it was okay. It was, um, yeah, it was a bit of fun. It was a bit of fun. And yeah, they, I think they filmed the, the Nupo show as well, didn't they? When Yeah. The, the Kalzagi promotion. Yeah, when I think Harry Miles down a bit of a ball again off ends on it. Turn box it turn up at the press conference without a suit on. <laughs> <laughs> I think he got sent home or something. But um yeah, it was it was a good experience. Um I can't remember the show in the board now. I don't know what I think did I'm, Jamie Arthur box on it as well? I can't remember. Um, that was uh, that was Kazagi's first promotion, wasn't it? Yeah, that's where I, that's where I, um, I think I failed to make the weight on it. I I, right. I think I, I weighed a little bit over, and I had to go and take a go and have a sauna, which which I don't think I would. <laughs> <laughs> I went and, the sauna and yeah made the weight yeah it was it was a good experience that tv show was it was made almost like um like a, a slightly humorous type of not quite a full serious documentary but it was a, a bit humorous a bit of a um, bit showbiz type with the Kalzagis involved did you exactly. find people reacting to you different in the street did you do you know it's a different type of person recognize you after that document documentary they probably did, but um, I, I honestly, I think I've been punched too much in the head and I'm, I'm losing a lot of my mem- memories at the minute, I think. But, um, I honestly can't think back about it. I, it's, yeah, it's a bit of a blur. All my career's a bit of a blur, but um, mm. yeah, I'm not sure if, um, yeah, I might need some tests on my head or something. <laughs> <laughs> of course, when Joe Calzaghe, um when he left Frank Warren towards the tail end of his career, uh, it put you boxers in a bit of an awkward position, the rest of the, the Calzaghe boxers. And am I right in saying this, this was the point when you left Enzo Calzaghe? Or, did it, or was it Enzo withdrew from boxing at that point? I can't quite remember. Well, it, the, point, the, the point of this happening was obviously the... Joe and obviously Frank was having their issues and it was it was going on in court and what have you. And that's when Frank Warren and then decided to chuck me to the wolves and chuck me with Matthew Raw. 
<laughs> but, yeah. I mean, people forget now, but Matthew Hall at, at the time had a reputation as a bit of a mini mini Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson, yeah. But it was all around the same time. They had the court case going on. I felt, well, I I, I, re, um, I went back to not training properly. Um, my diet went out the window. I don't know if you heard about the the my bulimia issue that was on the news. Yeah. Yeah, so I resorted to losing weight by making myself sick. And yeah, and then obviously I had the math war fight and at the same time. And obviously lost in two or two or three rounds, I can't remember. And yeah, then straight soon as that happened, obviously Frank, I let off Frank Warren. Good luck with your future, but we, we're no longer going to, we no longer want anything to you. And due to the split with the cars, Aggies and him, he said he was let he was releasing me from my contract. So yeah, it was a bad time at the time. I guess I lost my Commonwealth title and I had a letter off Frank Warren saying I'm gone. He doesn't due to the split with the with the cars, Aggies. He didn't want nothing to do with my career anymore, and he wished me well. So yeah, and then obviously we obviously that. Enzo kind of finished as well, and we'd obviously all moved on elsewhere. So yeah, it was a, it was a nightmare nightmare time. It was, it was so much crap going on, and yeah, so I had to start try and rebuild again somewhere else. And I think I'm right in saying it was at this point you started training with Gary Lockett. Yeah, well, I think we've done the. It was um, me, Gavin, Harry Miles, I think Cleverly might have been there, and Tony Doherty. And we was all, I mean, we was out jogging, and it's like, what are we going to do, guys? Where are we going to go? And like, <laughs> it was <laughs> it was like, um, someone wanted to go here, someone wanted to go there, someone was there. And Gavin said, I'm going to speak to Gary Locke, I'm going to go with Gary Locke, yeah. Brad would come in. I was like, ah, didn't really want to. So, I mean, I had a good relationship with Tony Borg from previous. And I obviously said that to Gavin as well. I said, I think we should go, go and have a chat with Tony Borg and see if he, he'll take us on and stuff. And Gavin said, no, I'm going to lock it. And I, I just followed suit, I guess. I follow, I went down there with Gavin and yeah, we, we teamed up with Gary and the other boys went elsewhere. I can't I think Kerry Oak went to up to Manchester with Carl maybe is it Carl? Can't Carl Greaves. Which, no, not Carl Greaves. I can't think of his name now, but yeah, Kerry went to up to Manchester, Tony went and Tony Docky. Oh, he came down the. He was Ugari, yeah, Tony Dotti. Yeah, as well, yeah. And yeah, we just all went separate ways. And I mean, it was sad. But um, yeah, we all tri- went, went different ways and tried to do what we could. So, what was it like training with Gary compared to Enzo? Um, I mean, every, every train I've been with, they're all, they're all good, you know what I mean? But. For me personally, no one's ever got the best of me like Enzo could. I mean, and from 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 that day, I mean, that was it. My career was done. So, is it fair to say that after the the Hall fight and after you left Enzo Calzaghi, or you 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 split with Enzo for for the reasons we mentioned, that your attitude to boxing changed? Yeah, yeah, I. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was never the most ambitious anyway. But um obviously when 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 that when that's finished, I mean it it was my career was pretty much done, I think. Yeah. But I'm just looking at your record you know on box I mean you still had some pretty good wins after the hall fight. I mean you you beat uh, Bambi, you beat uh, Lomax. So you still had talent on on given lights. 
Yeah, it was. It was a. With me, it was just a case of, I mean, who's going to turn up on the night? And yeah, that was it. It was, I mean, my the ambition. It, like I went to um, Bulgaria and I fought Rabchenko for the U. It was probably my biggest fight in my career, but to me, it didn't mean nothing. I mean, I fought Rabchenko for the European and the silver WBA title, and yeah, it it. I mean, it was the biggest title I fought for, but it po- po- at the time probably didn't mean nothing to me. It was, I mean, it was, yeah, didn't mean anything. So at this stage of your career, then you you were just looking to make as much money as possible. Would that be fair to say? Um, no, I wouldn't say that because money was never an option. Uh, I would if if someone offered me a fight, it wouldn't be a case of oh, what they're gonna give me. It'd be it'd be I'd give an answer. I say yeah, let's do it, let's fight. But um, it was I mean I was never I was never hard work for anyone. I mean if if someone needed me, then I was always available. Yeah. So what, you you box pretty much all over Britain, and did you ever box on the continent? Um, just looking at your record, you you boxed in uh, well all okay. over the UK. Yeah, I boxed a few different countries as well, Bulgaria, on um, Ricky Atten's promotion, and Denmark, I think. Yeah, I flew a few different countries. I, I took, I I didn't. Like I said, the money or anything didn't matter. I would just say, yeah, and that was it. It was an holiday. <laughs> and you fought some pretty big names as well along the way. Um, Frankie Garvin, uh, Eubanks, Billy Joe Saunders. Yeah. Um, I mean, did, did, you, did you, when the phone call rang and said, uh, Bradley, are you available to fight so-and-so? Would you, would you ever... Look at a guy's record, or would you think mm, I'm not sure about fighting him, or would you just take the fight straight away? Well, if I look back on my career now, if I didn't want so many losses, you know what I mean, I, I get some shit off people now, but I, well, he lost 25 or whatever he lost. You know what I mean, so I'm like, oh, should I have took them fights? But yes, I would have. <laughs> and um, yeah, I would if I look back now, I would have thought the Danny Butler fight in Newport, I think it was 2011. 2012, the Danny Butler fight. That that should be my final fight. I mean, I, I got a win over him in Newport. Realistically, that should be my last fight. And I, I could have retired. My vet wouldn't have looked as bad as it does now. But um, I could turn out. And the next fight after that, I was... Danny Butler was like middleweight. So I was considering going back and and trying to trying to get back some sort of title or some sort of title fight and the next option was Brad will you fight Patrick Mendy and that's probably the stupidest thing I've ever done <laughs> and I won the fight but I went up there with my mate to um, wherever it was I, I went up there with my mate and got on the scales and he, I just looked at him. I thought, "What? What am I doing?" <laughs> like I said as well, I would get, I would obviously lose fights before I go in the ring by looking at people and think, you "No, know I mean." And Patrick Mendy, he's probably one of the person. He was like a, he was like a machine, mm. massive, <laughs> and I was just carrying loads of fat. And I got on the scales, and then he weighed like a pound over or something like that. So I was telling them, I was going, oh, listen, he needs, he's, he's overweight. They didn't care. They brushed that off. They was like, no, we, we was told that weight. And I was like, well, what's happening here? Um, but yeah, I, I had to take the fight and I got a win, which was, which is always good. Mm. But he was, yeah, that, that was another occasion where I thought he could have beat me before we got in the ring. Um, but yeah, it was a good fight. And then after that fight, then it was on to Billy Joe Saunders. So from the Danny Butler fight, 
and then Andrew Mendy fight. That's I think that's when my career pretty much died. It was it was done. It was uh, yeah. It was it was a case of you just got to fight whoever they say, and that's how it was. That's how I got. That's how my career ended. I think with the Butler fight, if I'm right in saying, I think I was taking pictures ringside that night, and I think Butler he pulled ahead on the scorecards, and you you come from behind to stop him. If I'm right in saying, I um. I think they added level going into the eighth round. Right. Uh, got them, like, with about 30 seconds to go. So the 10 8 round gave me the decision. But, um, yeah, that, that, was an, that was another occasion in Newport, my, I, where I'm the hometown boxer, and he had more support than me. I mean, I don't know. He had a, yeah, he had a bigger following me in Newport, my hometown. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I guess um, if you like, if you got a big support and big crowd, and you got stuff like that, I guess people would, some of them will have a word. You say, "Oh, Brad, listen now, call it a day. You've done, you've done enough now. Call it a day." But um, I never had a crowd. I, I mean, I never had a big fan base. So it was just, so it was just a case of getting in and having a fight, and that's it. But were people advising you at this stage, like friends and family and people within boxing, were they advising you at this stage to retire from the sport? No. Um, who did I fight? I think I was with Gary Lockett when I boxed. After the Mendy fight, I got a win. After the Butler fight, I got a win. I thought, oh, here we go. We're gonna, we can drop the welt, the weight now, and we can do this now. But obviously the men, Mendy, Mendy fights come up. The Mendy fight come up and I had to take it. I got a win, which then I thought that was put me in a good place again to drop back on the weights. But they phoned, they said the only fight off, offered you now is Billy Joe Saunders. So I took that fight and yeah, it didn't turn out too well. When you were going into fights, and I know. People look, look at boxers almost as um, machines, almost. And yeah. but at the end of the day, you're still human beings. You still, as you've already said, I mean, you got you got emotions. You feel fear. For these fights, were you worried about physical harm harm being caused to you and long term damage? Not so much. No. Um, obviously, I've, I've 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 gone on about my bad eyesight since box since finishing boxing. And got a bit in, in trouble for that, so I don't, can't go too much into that, I don't think. But um, yeah, it, it was, I was never worried about anything. It was just, I just wanted to keep doing it, just keep fighting. And if I could still do it, I'd still do it. You know what I mean? I, but yeah, come to an end, they, they put an end to it at the end of the day, and that's it. But if I could keep doing it, I mean, I took, I took risks with my eyesight previously, and I'd, I'd still do it. It, it was it was just addic- I'm addicted to it. I mean, it, I've been doing it since I was 10. So, I mean, it was, it's all I knew what to do. So, for me, it was just keep going, keep going and keep going. For most normal people, and you know, to, to be a boxer, so as a top-level boxer like yourself, you have to be something different. I think you'll be slightly wired up, slightly different. But for most people it wouldn't be difficult to quit a sport that involves getting punched in the head by very fit, healthy people. So, yeah. And, and you've already said yourself you didn't particularly like boxing. You felt very nervous before the fights. Yeah. Yet you, you, you seem to, you, you found it difficult to, to quit the sport. Well, it, it was a job. No, I mean, some people don't like getting up and going to their job, but they have to, <laughs> they have to, they have to do it. And boxing is not something I really like to do. I mean, I didn't like getting punched and stuff like that, but um, I I continue to do it. But um, I mean, it's not all negative side. Really. It's not I didn't like it, but I used to love going in and showing off. You no, know I mean, drop my hand, showboat, and I used to love all our side of it. <laughs> it's just the uh, the punch into the head and stuff like that, and yeah, that's that's the the other side of it. And I, I can't actually remember the the exact fight. Uh, by name, but there's a couple of fights in the sort of the second half of your career which 
could have gone your way, but they were, they were giving us losses or draws from what I can remember? Um, well, from my career, the way I look at it is it finished in 2012 and anything afterwards, you know I mean, 20 losses or whatever, <laughs> whatever I amounted. But um, yeah, from 2012 onwards, from the, from the Billy Joe Saunders fight onwards, you know I mean, I don't really look at that as part of my career, to be honest. And like, as you asked earlier about the vets, did anyone advise me on quitting? And I guess when I boxed Billy Joe Saunders, Gary Locke was in my corner. I was training with him. And after the fight, he, he said, listen, Brad, you've done good with your career, done brilliant. Should be proud, but I'm not gonna be part of it anymore, will you? You need to I I I think you should retire. And I I mean I I, I didn't think anything of that. I just thought retire, what's he on about? Retire. You know what I mean? I, I, I just couldn't see it, but you know I mean he he was truthful and I probably should have listened to him at the time. But um yeah, so we parted companies uh Start part of company and yeah, then the next five six years, I continue just to drift between people and yeah, that was it. But yeah, Gary, he said I should retire, but I wasn't one to listen to people and I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And the last, the t- the tail end of your career, shall we say, from say. 2015 onwards, 2016 onwards. What you, you were just look, looking for a payday? We, we, do you have any ambition left to win any titles at that point? No, it was it was gone. Um, yeah, it was gone. It was just a uh, just case of fighting. I mean, it was like I said, I never turned down a fight. If the phone rang, it'd be a case of yes, I'm there. You know I mean, and I don't like to think of myself as a journeyman, but um, I guess that's the path I went down. I mean, I was I was a yes man, so um, yeah, I would I would just say yes to any fight. It wouldn't matter what weight, wouldn't matter who it was against. Um, the Chris Eubank fight, I got that phone call. I don't even think I was in training to be honest. I think I think at the time the phone call I had a pint in my hand, and they said. Um, Brad, will you fight um, Chris Eubank on Saturday? And I think this is on the Wednesday. And I said, well, how many tickets can we get? Uh, how many people can I bring over on the plane? And they said, oh, you can bring two. So <laughs> so I phoned my mate, then, my best mate, and I said, fancy come to Ireland on Saturday? I'm fighting Eubank. He said, yeah. I said, all right, well, we're flying out Friday. Uh, <laughs> that was it. No, I me mean, it was it was just an it was just a trip trip first. Uh, so we flew out to Ireland then, and I I boxed him, and yeah, I, I boxed him on two days' notice. But you know I mean, it was it was just a case of saying yes, getting a fight. And I think something I worried a lot of people who cared about you and people within Welsh boxing who known you over the years. Probably myself included. As your career went on, you you were taking fights, and you, you mentioned being like a journeyman, but you never actually boxed like a journeyman. In all your fights, you always give value for money, and you always went out there trying to win, or you were aggressive and you were entertaining to the fans, which is not generally something a journeyman do. Journeymen tend to look after themselves and protect themselves and try not to get in fights. Whereas you, you weren't acting acting like a journeyman. You were acting like a fight. They go out there trying to give it it all still. Well, I only knew one way to do things, and that's, that's the fight. And I, I can just cover up and take less. You know I mean, I can cover up and just take someone around. You know what I mean? And so I had to throw punches back. So, yeah, I, I, I could never be a journeyman. But, yeah, I, I um, think Poland, I, I, I boxed Poland, I think. Um, I, th- I thought I got a win out there, to be fair. But, you know I mean, that. At that stage, that stage of my career, I didn't really care about the wins. It was just case getting, get, just getting the fight, and that's it. And the final fight of your career against Kieran Gethin in uh, the Ice Arena, Wales, in Cardiff. 
what's your what's your recollection of the night? What's your thoughts? It was just like a spa session, wasn't it? it was, <laughs> that's all I remember. It was just like a spa. It was um, yeah, I don't nothing. Yeah, it was nothing to it. It was just just a quick payday, and that was it. I didn't really think much. I mean, I don't really bad mouth anyone, but I mean, I, I didn't think he, I didn't think he'd beat me. But obviously, you no, know, I me, mean, I wasn't twenty anymore. So, but um, yeah, it was just, it was just a. I think it's the only Welsh boy I lost to. I think in my career, which is maybe the only thing that annoys me a little. Lo- local <laughs> bragging rights, is it? <laughs> yeah, something like that. But, uh, yeah, it, it was nothing. You no, know, I me, mean, I. Uh, I didn't want to lose my last fight in Wales to a Welsh boy, but it happened. It is what it is. We move on. How did you feel once that fight was over? Because I think everyone sort of knew before the fight that this was going to be probably going to be the final fight of your career. So how, how did you feel emotionally when you, you finally knew that you were now a, an ex-boxer? Uh, yeah, but I had meetings with the Welsh board before that, and they they were showing concern. And yeah, after after the fight, I got out and well, I knew it was my last fight anyway. If, if I if I wasn't if I no disrespect to him, but if like uh, if I couldn't beat him, I shouldn't be boxing anyone. But which doesn't sound too good. No, I say it out loud. <laughs> yeah, but. Yeah, if I lost to him, that, that was it. It, it, it. Yeah. But did, did you feel sad, or did you feel emotional, or did you feel anything at all when you when you realised you were, you weren't going to box again? No, I don't think it's setting because, like I said, I I my crowd, my fans were gone. I mean, I did I I had a, quite a few people here, that, an handful of people. I mean, the support was always gone, so. I had nothing. Yeah, so I didn't didn't really feel nothing. I think I just got changed and gone car and drove drove home, and <laughs> that was it. It was, it was yeah, it was nothing to it. And what's it like now being a, an ex boxer as opposed to being a, a current boxer? Because even though you said that you didn't have a you never had a massive fan base, but I bet most boxing fans across Britain will recognise you. And I'm guessing probably if you go to most shows. In Britain, you 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 probably people come up to talk to you and have a, a picture and a, a chat. Yeah, well, I think my that last fight was I think it's coming up three years in April, so three years next month. And since then, I don't think I've been in in a boxing gym. I have been to a boxing show. I I don't think I think I just kind of disappeared off the map. So, but uh, it is something I want to get back into. I mean, I I did have my own gym at one time, and I was I was I'm thinking about getting my trainer's license license back. And you know I mean, I'm in the I'm not far from the Cardiff area at the minute. So yeah, I'd like to get involved with an amateur gym around here and get back into it and try and relight that fire and that spark. And and yeah, I'd like to do it again. But for the t- for the three years, I, I've literally. I mean, I've nothing to do with boxing. What advice would you give to a, a young amateur boxer who's considering turning pro? Well, just dedicate yourself. You know, I mean, if you're gonna do it, you can't do it half-hearted, which I I tried to do. Um, but don't get me wrong, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed. It. I mean, I. <laughs> it, it, but, um, yeah, it was, I enjoyed my career. It was brilliant. But um, if I was speaking to someone else, I'd say dedicate yourself. You know I me, mean? dedicate yourself to want to achieve these big titles and stuff like that. Um, which I, I mean, I didn't really do. But uh, yeah, so you just got to dedicate yourself. Get, you know I mean, be part like that's what I miss most about boxing now is not being part of a family. And uh, the, I mean, the boxing family is, to me, is Newbridge Boxing Gym. That's, you know I mean, Joe, Enzo, Gavin Reese, 
I mean, that's that's the boxing family to me. And yeah, it's something I miss. So I, I'm open to join up an amateur gym and just try and, I mean, get that buzz back in my life. And I can remember one time, I can't, I think it might have been a Steve Sammy Sims show uh, in Newport, I guess, where yourself and Gavin were both dressed up as gangsters. You, you went obviously boxing, but you, you were in the crowd dressed up as gangsters on, on like a dinner show type of thing. <laughs> that's, my, that's my normal attack. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a normal outfit. <laughs> you, a bit now. You want sorry, mate? You fool me a bit now. I'm like, I can't remember I, that, can you? You were dressed yeah. like an old fashioned, um, slightly old fashioned, uh, like the, the suits and the hat. Well, I, I probably still got that in the wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's who went to work on a Monday morning, is it? My suit jacket and my. <laughs> my... So, I'm just trying to look trendy. Oh no, no, you did. You did look trendy. <laughs> yeah, Tammy. Um, yeah, I work. I actually work with Steve now. Steve Sims. Okay. So um, yeah, he was telling me the other. He was telling me a couple of stories every week about his career and stuff and yeah it was, it was, it's, it's good I mean to hook up with someone and we, we live this the uh, old past and stuff like that so it's always nice to speak to someone but like I said usually I'm just I'm, I'm reclusive I'm like a bit of a loner and yeah that, that that's me and what to do with yourself day to day now Bradley I know you mentioned you were you working with Steve there former British champion yeah, I work with Steve, um, but today now I'm probably gonna go back to what ruined my career and have a few drinks, get pissed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, uh, I'm with the missus today and the the baby, so we'll go for a walk now. Go for a walk and just just chill out, enjoy being forty. She's happy with that now because she was she's already forty, so <laughs> didn't like. Going out with the toy bows or pony. <laughs> so I've grown her in age now, so she's a bit happier today. And uh, you, you're still living around the Newbridge area, are you, uh, Bradley? No, I'm a, I'm a Barry boy now. With a, oh, you Barry? Okay. Barry boys. I, I haven't bumped into the Selby brothers yet, though. <laughs> perhaps they need sparring, perhaps, Brad. Well, no, not with this old man. <laughs> I I love to get myself back fit and join, and get in a gym and start having a little sparring with people and stuff like that. Yeah, and that's my I guess that's my aim is for the next few months is just get get back to boxing fit and maybe go around and train with a few gyms and yeah, ideally I'd like to get back to just doing, having a bit of sparring and stuff like that. And just, yeah, just getting back in the boxing. Do you keep in contact with any people from your, your boxing days apart from Steve Sims? Um, obviously, Gavin Reese. I mean, oh, Gav, yeah. I mean, Gav's always been close. He's the godfather to my boy. But um, he's yet to give him any gifts. And <laughs> coming up, so maybe he'll make an appearance, but... Yeah, but no, it's serious. Um, no, I don't. I, I, I've distanced myself from boxing altogether. To be honest, I, I don't play. I don't have any involvement in it. And yeah, it's just like I said, I'm I'm on the outskirts of Newbridge now, which is Barry. Uh, <laughs> I'm a bit of a newbie to the thing, so yeah. So it's, it's a quiet life. Okay, Bradley. Um, well, it's, it's been great to speak to you this morning. I really, really enjoyed talking about your career. And I really, I really enjoyed watching your career as well because in your fights, you, ne- you never quite knew what to expect. Because by, by, your, by your own admission, you, you never really knew which Bradley Price was going to turn up. And so that's probably why, why you were always so excited to watch as well. Well, that's it. Well, like you said, uh, when I got punched, that's when I would come to, come to life. I mean... Um... That's when the fight got started for me when I when I start getting a few smacks in the face. But um, yeah. So who, who was the hardest person to smack you in the face? Then Bradley, what's a lot of good good names? 
Um, maybe Gary Lockett. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gary, Gary's a big, a big banger. We were going to a few sparring stories. I, I, I've had a few Bobby Dazzlers where my, <laughs> I, I think, because like with me, I go to spar people, I think we're just sparring. You know what I mean? I, remember I went, I, I, I think I was with Tony Borg at the time. We went sparring with Gary Lockett. And we just sparring normal, blah blah blah, and boom, whoa, my legs turned the jet. <laughs> I say, what? Uh, who's the other one? Is it, it oh, and then Cody, Cody Davis, and mm-hmm. sparring with him. And then me, I keep going forward, charging forward, and I throw my punches, and boom, yeah. So, there's two sparring stories for you guys. What about Cody. Enzo? Enzo Lacronelli, <laughs> did you ever spar with Enzo when he was in Kazagi Gym? Yeah, yeah, it's part everyone. I mean, um, but obviously, oh, are we looking at? Oh, we've lost, lost the. There we are, Bradley. You're back. Yeah, but um, obviously, you know, I mean, he's he's a big lump in he, so it was just a case of. I like to think he just used speed work on me, like like Joe. But uh, yeah, that's the only two I think probably people who shook me up in a in the sparring session. That's um, Cody and Lockett, but. Um, yeah, the fun times, eh? I miss them. <laughs> and of course, another guy. So we got on a bit now, but uh, another guy you you were in the the Kalzagi gym with was um, Nathan Cleverly. I think he was eighteen when he was the, with the Kalzagis. No, I think when he when he come with us, I think he was. I think he was only like 15, 14, was he? 15. Okay, he was amateur there as well, was he? Um, or was he? Yeah, he was with us when he was a kid, I think. He was, he was, only, he was tiny. Right. We beat shit out of him when he was that sick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I see some photos of it, me, him, and Joe. And I think in Cleverly got, wouldn't he be about 15 on him? But um, who knows, maybe he was 18. But No, you're probably, you're probably right, actually, now, now I think about it, because I can't think which amateur gym he would have been with. So he must have been with the. Uh... Yeah, I think he was, he was with his dad when he Vince. Mm. And. You know, Vince brought in that would bring him down the gym sometimes and stuff. And yeah, yeah, when he's got 78 and then obviously turned pro, and we we all we was all in camp together and stuff. But yeah, Did you see that Nathan was a, a good fighter at a young age. Yeah, he's de- he was he's dedicated, really. You know, what I mean, he was really dedicated. You know, what I mean, he he wanted it. You know, what I mean, something I, I never <laughs> I never did. You know, what I mean, um. You would see some people, you know, like Joe, you got Gavin, you got Nathan, people who really want it and they, they dedicate themselves to the sport. And yeah, it's just something I, I guess I, I mean, I never dedicate myself to the sport enough. Well, but even so, you were still Commonwealth champion, which is a, you know, a great achievement. You boxed some really good guys, boxed on a lot of big bills. So, uh... yeah, like I said, that's. That's why I'm happy with my career. Is like, are you happy with your career? Yeah, I'm happy. I'm, I mean, um, I regret a lot of things, but it is what it is. And for for how I did things, I, I think I'm happy with the achievement. Okay, then, Bradley, um, thanks for your time this morning, mate. It's been really good to chat with you. Really enjoyed listening to your stories and learning some new things about you. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and your, your walk. Hello, so we're Pontefreed. Can I take your order, please?